Uh, welcome to Scaling Pinterest. Uh, my name's Marty, and my other speaker's Yash. And today we wanted to take you through a tour of what it was like to build Pinterest from a couple thousand page views per month to billions. Uh, and in particular, we want to give the talk that we wanted to be, uh, that we would have liked to have attended last year when we were a tiny company, growing like crazy, a lot of options on the table, and not some clear guidance on where we should go or what options to choose uh, for our infrastructure. There's a lot of choices out there. There's hundreds of them. 20 to 30 are actually good, and two to three are actually very good. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'll describe what Pinterest is, I'll describe um, um, a little bit about how we grew and what that felt like and what that looks like, and then we'd also like to talk about what worked, what didn't work, uh, and uh, the lessons that we learned along the way. So first, uh, for people who don't know, Pinterest is uh, it's an online pin board to organize the things that inspire you. So. Uh, you go around to the internet, you find things that you like, little images, all these great little tidbits, and you bring them back and you put them on boards and you, you fill out, uh, you curate a bunch of the things that you like around the world. Uh, and then also all of those link back to the original source. Uh, like every social networking site, uh, we have users. This is me. Uh, a user is a uh, links back, they have authentication, they have a description of who they are. Uh, on Pinterest we have boards. Uh, Boards are collections of, of pins, and pins are individual images. Uh, for instance, here's one pin. Uh, a pin, and you can think of it as an image uh, that someone really liked, and, they, uh, and there's some extra information around it. So there's a description of why it's important to them. Uh, there's a little bit of information, uh, meta information, who owns the pin, these sort of things, who's allowed to see it. Uh, and then there's, uh, very importantly, there's um, where it came from. In this case, I uploaded it. Uh, it actually, I, I didn't source it right. It, uh, if I linked it from a from che uh, I can't have cheeseburger, then it would have had a link back to them, uh, and that's very important. So if, if somebody pins something from Etsy, it will link back directly to that product on Etsy. Um, also, just like any other network, social networking site, we have the ability to follow people that you like. Uh, you can follow users, you can follow boards, and when they pin something, when, when somebody I'm following pins something, it goes into my feed. And so here you see a list of uh, the pins that. Um, of people I've followed. Uh, and so to get your head into engineering mode, I'll show you what our, our basic hierarchy of our core data set looks like. We have users, uh, users have boards, uh, boards have pens, and then also, oh shoot. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, users can follow other users, users can follow other boards. This is our core hierarchy. We also have other little uh, bits here and there like, a uh, user can like a pen, or a user can repin other people's pens, that sort of thing. So to give you an idea of our growth, I had to leave off numbers here, but uh, you can think of the top scale as being, it's page views, and you can think of uh, the, top, the top bar there being bajillions. I don't, billions is, is the number I'm allowed to quote. Um, and just like any other company, I want to give you a tour of how this grew. Uh, it started in March 2010 was really when it started to be released, and um, we're small at the time. We have a design and we had a, a schema so that the product is still being worked out and we don't even know what the infrastructure looks like. So we're working out the product, we need to keep the infrastructure very elastic so we can change it however we want really fast. So we, uh, had, we were on Rackspace, uh, we had one small web engine running Python and one small MySQL database to, to store the data. Um, then uh, for the next um, about eight months or so, uh, we were what our founder describes as uh, we were in stealth mode, but we didn't want to be. You know, nobody knew about us. Uh, but we were, we were starting to pick up some traction. We were, we were past family and friends. We were growing just a little bit. And now we're to the point where our, our infrastructure is a little bit more complicated. The design and product were really actually kind of solid at this point. They, they haven't changed much since then, so that was good. So our infrastructure was really the next big piece to tackle. At the time, it was fairly simple. It was, uh, we were on Amazon. We had S3 for our images. We don't host any of our own images, uh, any of the pinned images. And we had cloud front fronting it. Uh, we had an engine of Xbox with four web engines, also still running Python. We've always run Python. Uh, we had one MySQL database and one read slave uh, for backup mostly. And we had a task processors, MongoDB, and a few other boxes here and there. So it was nice and simple, but you'll notice there's no cache on here. There's nothing. Finally, at this point, our nasty, some of our really bad SQL queries, our massive joins and our distincts and our, our uh, all of our other weird constraints are starting to show their um, scalability bottlenecks. Uh, and we were starting to grow like mad. We, we started being picked up. So fast, uh, fast forward to September, 
and we've just been through a wild ride. Uh, it doesn't matter what scale you're at, it's really about the growth. And the whole way up, we were doubling every month and a half. And so every week, something new was broken. Uh, and it was just a massive, massive pain. Uh, and when you're in that mode and you're not getting any sleep, uh, you're constantly trying to find a solution that will just take care of it for you, solve it all for you. Uh, and you, you don't want to do, um, you try to avoid certain engineering things because you're working on others. And uh, what would be great is if there was a magic clustering solution that scaled for you and you didn't have to have a schema and you didn't have to, uh, you add boxes, you hit the button, boom, it's, it's available. And, uh, when that happens and when you see all these promises, you do what we do, and that's to be become a mess. Uh, we had, at some point, we had Cassandra, MintBase, MintCache, Redis, Elasticsearch, Mongo, uh, MySQL, and a few others floating around in there. And uh, what happens at that point, when, uh, at this point we had three engineers. Uh, it was two engineers and one other guy who just come on. So it was really two engineers scaling up all of this stuff. And we had to be experts in all of these pieces. So we had to know when they fail, how did they fail? Uh, how does, because Hangar fails in a diff very different way from Minbase. Uh, and knowing all those pieces, we're having expensive support contracts, it, it's just, it's, it's too much. And at this point, we were also on the edge. So every one of these services was, was hot. It was, it was grinding to a halt. Uh, so we decided it was time to do uh, some big drastic changes. This is the point where we um, split out our whole database, re-architected everything, and we simplified. We learned our first lesson here, and that was, if you bring it into your system, it will fail. So when it fails, you have to be prepared. So keep it simple, just have a few in there. So our architecture changed drastically, and now, fast, uh, fast forward to more around. Uh, now, this is actually, this, this graph is from about February. Uh, and now, we're back to the simple, we're back to a simple layout. We have MySQL and Redis and Memcache at the core of it all. Uh, much much easier to manage, much simpler, doesn't fail in many complicated ways, and life is life is good. Uh, I'd like to tell you about why some things survived and why certain things that other things did not, because we were surprised by some of them, and uh, and I thought that'd be interesting to, to relay this. Uh, so why Amazon? A lot of people ask us this, uh, some because they're, they're amazed that we can stay on Amazon all the way through, and. Amazon has very good reliability. I've been in data centers, I've been in, in Amazon, and I still feel like the reliability is still very good. Um, it's got great reporting, great support, great tools. So if you're growing a company uh, and you need and you don't really want to write your own load balance and bring in all these tools, they've got it for you. They've got DNS, they've got MapReduce. So we actually use load balancing DNS and MapReduce now. It's great. I, we don't have to set it up, it just works. Uh, they also have databases, we don't use them, but uh, they, they look great. I mean, you, they manage the database and they'll grow with you. They have uh, basically min cache that they manage. So you, you say, I need this many gigs. You don't have to manage individual min cache boxes. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to grow, to grow with you. The best part about Amazon, the thing that we cannot beat as we were growing so rapidly, is that you can have new instances up in a second. I mean, like five minutes. And if it takes longer than that, I'm surprised. It never takes more than five minutes and combine that with Puppet or some other automated imaging system, you have a new box ready in, in 10 to 20 minutes, depending on, on what it does. So if we're scaling one day, oh, oh my god, we need another cache, we need it now. We can have 10 caches up in 20 minutes and in our pool ready to go. Uh, what are the cons of, of Amazon? Limited choice. So we, um, our database boxes, all of our database boxes are a four-way rated, um, simple hard drives, uh, low speed hard drives with uh, 15 gigs of RAM. So it's not too big. If we wanted to have the, the big, you know, 256 gigs of RAM on top of SSD, we can't. It's just, it's the nature of the beast, we can't have it. Uh, but what is the pro? Limited choice. <laughs> we don't have to go out to Dell and figure out, do we want a three gigahertz, 3.3 gigahertz, agonize over it. It, 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 it really just, um, it simplifies the whole process. It also drives our architecture. Uh, our whole architecture is around working on simple commodity hardware. So now we can take this and go anywhere. We didn't, uh, we didn't go the route of being able to say, um, we've got a bad joint, let's throw an SSD at it and we'll survive for the next you know, six to 12 months. Uh, we actually had, we, we were forced to engineer it and that was the right thing to do. Engineer it right when you're young. Why MySQL? Uh, MySQL is extremely mature. It's been around for 27 years. We've, uh, it's extremely well known, extremely well liked. Everybody who, uh, you, you would talk to if you're hiring an engineer for web, they've either heard of it or they've admin it or hell, they may have even written part of it. Uh, it rarely has catastrophic loss of data or any loss of data. We've never lost data on it uh, once that I can, I can think of. Uh, response time to request rate is, is, is almost perfectly linear, is it, uh, linear as far as I can tell. Uh, as you bring in the request rate, some machines, uh, some different clustering systems, uh, as the request rate gets high, your response time will suddenly shoot up. We had one shoot up over the course of six hours, went from 10 milliseconds 
to 10, to 10 seconds. This is one random clustering solution. I'll just leave the name. Uh, but uh, MySQL will perfectly go until you decide, look, three seconds is too much <laughs> for this particular box, uh, or 100 milliseconds, whatever your SLA is. Uh, we've, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I love it. Uh, very good support. You've got extra backup, which allows us, uh, from Percona, that, that allows us to do online backups and then recover instantly. We don't have to, we don't talk about anymore about recovery that taking days or a week. Uh, you have InnoTops, you can introspect on what's going on right now, and MapKit's great for profiling. Uh, the community is awesome. Uh, everybody talks about MySQL. The MySQL dev site alone is, is fantastic, and uh, there's other sites uh, uh, that uh, people just love to talk about it. And you can go on Google and find your uh, fix for any problem you have in a second. Uh, and also, there's very good support from, uh, from Percona if you need someone to come and, and look at it. And you don't have that with certain other uh, systems out there that are open source and free. Uh, and also, MySQL is free, and I love free. Uh, in general, actually, uh, I'll just say this about our infrastructure. Free was something that we sort of stood by. I mean, we could have gone out and, and immediately thrown a lot of money at IBM or somebody. But at, at, at a web company that's a startup and not much money and trying to stay lean, you just can't do it. So why, why Memcache? Memcache is also extremely mature, very good performance, well-known, well-liked. It never crashes, except when the box goes down. So if Memcache can solve that, that's a bigger thing. Uh, very few failure modes. This is extremely important. I think the only way I know that Memcache fails for us is if you give it too much RAM and then it starts to hit I.O. That's the only way we know that it fails on this. It's also free. I love free. Uh, Redis. Redis is new, but it actually survived the rest of everything else that blew up in our face. Uh, uh, and we now keep it in our system permanently. If you don't know what Redis is, Redis is like Memcache, uh, but it's also got a few features on top of it. You have persistence, replication, and these really kind of cool data structures. You pay a little bit more in RAM cost, but you get a lot of convenience out of it. So the data structures include things like sets and lists and sorted sets, pub sub, uh, and blocking requests. Uh, it has persistence and replication, uh, which is really nice, especially if you want to start using it for a little bit more than just uh, straight cache. Uh, it's well known, well liked, everybody loves it now. It's, it's sort of everybody's talking about it, everybody's heard of it at least, and uh, most, people, uh, most people have heard of it, and some people have even used it. Uh, it's got nice atomic operations, uh, consistently good performance. The only problem with it is, is uh, you have to know where its bounds are, but if you stay within those bounds, you're great. So you, basically the only bound we, were, we ever found was you have to stay below 75% RAM if you use persistence. That's it, and then it's happy, and it's blazing fast. It's also free. Um, so what are the cons of, uh, of that kind of setup, MySQL, Memcache, uh, Redis? It doesn't do everything for you. Uh, out of the box, they don't scale, uh, they don't scale past one server, uh, they don't have high availability out of the box, and they won't bring you a drink, so I'm not too excited about that. Uh, so we went, uh, So when you start to grow, you really have to uh, do some more. So they, you start wondering, I've got to bring more boxes in the system, they all have to talk to each other, uh, and there's a lot of... A lot of options on the table there. So we have, we first classified them. You can think of, think of this as a spectrum, and we named it like this. Uh, clustering, we, we named as really the pieces that are um, really fully automatic. Uh, they automatically uh, distribute the, uh, your data across your whole system. Data can move anytime. Rebalances happen automatically, and nodes communicate with each other. And we labeled sharding as the exact opposite. The, the, uh, where the, whereas that one's super smart, this one's super dumb and simple. Uh, and where you have to decide how to distribute the data. Data, once it's down, in the purest sense, it does not move. Now, you can add a few layers on top of that and make it move, but in the purest sense of how we describe sharding, it does not move. It goes down, it's done. Uh, if you need to uh, add more capacity, you will split a database into uh, uh, multiple databases, uh, uh, into two new databases, and now you have more capacity. Uh, and nodes are not aware of each other. Uh, one node is over here, and one node is over here, and somebody else higher up talks down to them. Uh, so why is clustering uh, a really great solution, and why did we buy into it? Uh, so uh, this includes things like Cassandra, Membase, HBase, and RIAC. And the great thing about these, uh, when you see a white paper, you see a presentation about one of these, it's all glowing, it's all fantastic. Uh, it'll automatically scale your database. It's easy to set up. It spatially distributes all of your data. You don't have to do anything. Uh, you get high availability, you get low balancing, and there's no single point of failure. So why do you need an engineer? Uh, and so we, we, we bought into it. This is fantastic. We, we set it up. It's free. Uh, even groups like Cassandra, you can supply an, an image on EC2. You bring it up and you talk to it on the port. You're done. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, by the way, if you have any cats or kids, this is, this is not a good thing to do in the house. Uh, 
Well, so what we hit was, was I think what other people have alluded to about clustering, it's still fairly young. Uh, it's, it's only been around for a few years, it's not done. Uh, the community support is mixed because there's a lot of different new solutions and not many people know much about the details of it. It just hasn't been around long enough to get a, a really strong community uh, base. There are a few engineers with working knowledge of it, so I rarely bring in somebody who knows Ryak or knows Cassandra, but everybody knows MySQL, everybody knows Mimcache. So that's a problem. Uh, it's also got a difficult and scary upgrade mechanism because you've got all these little nodes talking to each other. Uh, so one's going to be on 1.7.1, you've got to upgrade to 1.7.2, and they have these complicated things. Well, if you're on 1.7.0, you really need to go to 1.7.1 and then to 1.72, and it just gets really complicated. Uh, and yes, there is a single point of failure. I lied to you. It's a huge one, and we hit it, and we hit it hard. Uh, to, to illustrate that point, here's a typical cluster. We have four boxes. They're all talking to each other. They're all excited. Everything's great. One goes bad. One goes bad. There. Uh, so now you've got, a, you've got a router on it. You bring in a new box. You do the usual thing. And automatically, the cluster points to it. Great. So there's no single point of failure. Uh, but there is. All of these run the same really complicated cluster management algorithm. And theoretically, uh, just the theory, the theory of how to, to gossip between these is difficult, uh, much less getting the implementation correct. All of these have to talk to each other. One has to say, hey, I've got too much data, you take it. And the other one has to say, okay, or, or maybe he says, no, I've got too much data, and it gets complicated. It's just, it's way too complicated. It's too much code, and it nailed us. And the way it nailed us is it's the same complex code. Uh, it failed and we had four major failure points across different clustering smart solutions that we use. Uh, data rebalance breaks, so one day rebalance stops. What do you do? Uh, you call support, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that happened to us, the logs tend to be bad because it's still a young product, so the, the, the maintenance is still not, not a strong point. They, they almost try to push you into the support contracts in the hopes that that's the only way you'll be able to survive. Uh, data corruption across all nodes. So you've got this one overarching algorithm that is really smart and, and doing its thing, and suddenly one day it decides to, I don't know, spray a bunch of bad bits, of, and it'll spread across the whole thing. And what do you do? You're, you're toast. Uh, we actually had a CTO come up to us from one other company and said, sorry, your data's gone. Like, okay, that's great. Um, I'm not going to call you back. Uh, improper, improper balancing is common, uh, where for some reason, uh, a lot of the data will be stuck on one server, and depending on how much uh, control they have, which is not usually often because these things try to be fully automatic, you shouldn't have to touch it, you, you can't do anything. This data's all the way over here, this one box is hot, the other boxes are sitting there happy on vacation. Uh, and sometimes you have to go all the way to support and say, how do I, get, how do I force this thing to be stupid and move the data over? Uh, Data authority failure also happened to us. You bring in a new box, it's at 80% done replicating off another box and says, hey, I'm the authority, you listen to me, and suddenly you lose 20% of your data. That happened to us, that was, that was fun 3 a.m. Uh, so our lesson learned, clustering is really scary. Uh, it's just, it, it's young. I mean, it, it eventually may take over, but it's currently young. It's not the proper solution right now, and it didn't work for us. Um, so let's go with sharding. Uh, why sharding? Well, first of all, you need sharding. Uh, if you're on one database, you need sharding so that you can have multiple databases to support your problem. Uh, you can split your databases to add more capacity. You can spatially distribute and collocate your data. It's just like clustering. You have high availability and load balancing, but the piece that really worked for us is that it's much simpler. Uh, you have to spend some engineering effort up front, but it's not that complicated when you get down to it. Uh, and what you end up with is a much more robust system that doesn't require much maintenance, and uh, every piece of it is so simplistic that, uh, that you don't have a massive, uh, complicated, overarching uh, uh, oracle that, that can destroy your whole system at any time. You have literally one small page of code that decides where all the IDs go and where, where any data goes. Uh, so now you have to get into uh, all the decisions about how you shard, and I'd also like to describe it, uh, we're also going to go into when do you shard, because that's also a, a, that, was, that was a question that we got wrong, we waited too long, and to describe that, Yash is going to, to take over. Since you decided to go against clustering and choose sharding, the question is like, when should you exactly shard? So 
this has been a question which was haunting us like should we take this step earlier or like should we just delay it and like go with like much better architecture or like there might be a new database which would magically shard and like take us to the next level. So if you like shard early, you're like missing out the point of SQL where you cannot perform any simple ad hoc joins on your database and like build and ship features as fast as you should be doing. But on the other side, if you like decide to shard late, just like we did, you have this huge humongous pile of data sitting in your old database, and then you have these new shiny shards, and like you gotta make sure that your application splits your rights to build these infrastructures, which is pretty complicated. Like, I mean, like as a matter of fact, like performing writes is way simpler, but keeping the two databases in sync is like way tough. And like there's this question of like we have where a lot of issues where like users change the password, but the new password hasn't been migrated to the shards, and like we had like code where like okay if this user exists in shard, go respect the shard data. If it doesn't exist, go to the old database, read from the old database, and like they, there were like lots of problems. So like when you like decide to shard, just make sure like you are in this migration phase for as less amount of time as possible. So like before you even attempt sharding, like make sure your site design is solid. Just lock down your product features and like do a feature freeze. Like you're not gonna uh, build any no new features for the next couple of months. And like make sure like uh, the current schema is the one you want to go to into the shards because like you're like when you apply migrations into the shard, you're just like multiplexing your effort. You gotta run your migrations on all the shards and your application code has to be tolerant to these migrations and all. So like the first step to sharding is like make sure there are like no joints in your code base. Almost like zero joints. And then remove all the complex queries which includes like joints, add as much cache as possible. Just don't go to the DB for like a while. Just take the hit in your uh, take the hit in the servers, like just add more cache and just make sure you're not going to the DB much. And then before you attempt the final sharding, just functionally shard as much as possible. This is like the cheap sharding where you like take your huge table and move it to its own database. So in case of Pinterest, it was like a pin table which was growing a lot, like people were reaping a lot. So we just moved our huge table to its own database and then rewrote the application code to the top to the database. And we got like you got away for a couple of months to deal with it. And still you're growing with a lot of volume, query volume, then it's time you should think about serious sharding. So this is how like Pinterest transition looked like when we were sharding. We had a single database and we had like proper normalized data with all the relations between users, votes, pins, likes, comments. And then like as the query volume started to mount up, we start slowly started to denormalize, delete the foreign keys, add proper indexes, apply the explain statements and make sure you're hitting index all the time. And then even then the query volume went up with the traffic, add read slaves, add more cache. And then the cheap sharding like move your largest table to its own database and then get away for a couple of months. And then Finally, by the bullet, like you really partition and spray your data across all new shards. A couple of things to watch out when you shard is you have no question of joins. You got to replicate, uh, add redundancy to your data and write your tables such that your queries are very simple set of queries rather than any joins. And another feature we lost was like we couldn't do transactions anymore. Like. When we had to write to three, four tables, like we had to go to a different shard, complete the write, go to a different shard, complete the write. So there's like no question of transactions. But I think it was okay in our sense, in our case, because like we're not a bank and like we don't have like serious conflicts of issues there. And when you have these unique constraints, like you have to maintain a user table with username and email as unique, you can pretty much apply sharding solution out of the box. Like, you gotta have a huge database with single table where you write to the table, and once the write succeeds, that means the email or your username was unique, and then you proceed to the shards to complete your writes. So you got, when you have this simple report running 
as cron jobs, like you got to rewrite these to run on all the shards, aggregate the data, and then email the reports to your dev team send off. So like those were the couple of things we would have to watch out for. So how we shard it? So we took a very close look at how all the other people like sharded. Like we took a close look at Twitter's architecture and then Flickr's ticketing server's architecture, and like we took a close look around the Cassandra Spring-like structure, where when you add a node, you just repartition the data across the adjacent nodes. And like one lesson we learned without even implementing was like the less data you move across the shards, the more stable you are, and the less work you have to do. So like with that as our important motive, we just started to shard. We just pre-sharded for the next foreseeable feature for Pinterest. So like we just created a lot of databases on single machine, and we just split the databases when we are at a huge load of the database. So like initially we started with eight servers and started with 4,096 shards, and we had five twelve databases on each machine. And as we started to grow, we just throw cache, and then even then the query volume bounds up, then we move half of the databases to its own shard, and then make the application configuration, like, okay, the new shards are in this host, and the old shards are in this host. And that's how we just scale out of the box within, like, minutes. And high availability, like, we just run all our shards in multi-master replication mode, and upon, like, uh, failures in Amazon, which are pretty minute, we just flip the switch in our application configuration to move a, a physical, I mean, a bunch of shards into read-only mode for one or two minutes and let the replication catch up. And then we flip the read-only switch and then the writes again kicking back into the new mode. And then we take a slave backup of the new master again and then again it's all the same story. And all the uh, all the shards are pretty symmetric, like we have equal distribution of databases. Although we can go like hybrid structure where like if there are like a couple of celebrities on like each shard, we can just like pull that shard out and put it on its own machine and like deal with the scaling. So what happens when you have an increased load on the database? We just track down and profile our app right from the you know, user's browser to our network and then like measure the latency, like what's happening, was there any bad code that's being pushed over the last couple of weeks? We go through our ganglia graphs. And then like we come to the database and like see profile with MapKit and then see what kind of queries have been creeping up and then like okay, I think these are the right part of queries. We just have we just have a huge query volume and the traffic has has been steadily increasing. Then we like decide to split the shot where we just like move off of the databases to the new host and push the new configuration file to our application service to like okay, these shots are in this physical machine while these shots are in this new physical machine. It's pretty easy to do, like we just do this in like 12 minutes. <coughs> so this is our ID structure, like, so every ID in Pinterest architecture is like a 64-bit ID, where we dedicate a bunch of bits for the shard ID, and a couple of bits for the object type, and another couple of bits for the local ID inside the table. So instead of building a routing table and maintaining it and adding redundancy and replication and high availability for that index-based database, we just chose like if you if you what if you just have this routing in, built into the ID, you could just build services agnostic of language. We can just write this in Java, Python, in like six lines of code. Just like do the bit manipulation, get the shard ID, what is the table I have to go to, and get the local ID and bam, that's where your data is. So. If, Pretty much like when you ask for a pin, we just like do a cheap validation like, okay, is it exactly pin that you're looking for? And if the object type doesn't match, you're like, okay, this is something wrong we're doing. So like we built a, a REST layer on top of our MySQL. So we pretty much use MySQL as a storage engine. And that REST layer just peaks all the sharded infrastructure's calls. You just make a REST call and it would just go to the shard and get all your data back and return it. So why not an ID service? Like we saw like Twitter build this snowflake which generates 64-bit IDs even. So like it's pretty handy to have a, to generate ID even before you write to the database. Because you can just spawn a different in parallel all your tasks, like you write to the database, deliver it to all your followers, and you can do a lot of cool things. But 
we just felt like it's another piece of infrastructure you got to maintain. Just what if the ideal service just goes down? Like the master and the slave, both of them, and what if it goes down? Even though if your shards are up, you just can't function because we don't know where your data exactly exists. And we don't want to do an extra lookup just to know where our data is. So that's the reason why we went with building a routing table right inside your ID structure. So here's how our Python code looks like. We have this huge uh, dictionary to map, like, okay, the shards 1 to 5 will exist in this host shard db 01a, and 513 to 1024 exists in 02b. And like, when there is a failure, we just flip the multi-master replication, then the shard db 0 shard db 02a becomes the master from now on. Let's say we have to pick a user who exists in db 1025. We go to the lookup table and find out like the data exists in shard db 03a. Go to the table, select the database 01025. Go to the users table, pull the serialized data out of the user, and there, there's your data. I want to talk a little bit about the ID structure. Like, so we basically sharded on the user and. The reason was we had a huge opportunity where we could collocate all of the user data on one shot. Say you're rendering my user profile, you just don't have to go through all your 4096 shots to get the data. All, all user's data is collocated on his shot. So like if you're rendering a profile, you just like connect to one shot. Get, your, get the user, get his boats, get his pins, just render the page and like done. And most of these queries are even like cached, so you just don't have to spend time going to MySQL most of the time. And the local IDs are assigned by auto increment in MySQL, and we all know like MySQL auto increment just works out of the box. It's just like the most robust solution there. It just works perfectly, so we don't want to like build any uh, auto increment system ourselves. So instead of opening all the 65,000 shards initially, we just chose to open 4,096 shards initially. So that like when the, when we feel like okay there's going to be enough users on these shards and we're going to have a lot of pins for the next ten years, we just shut down this range and open another range like 4,096 to maybe like 10,000, and we we're going to push the new users into that range, and all the data will be collocated into that new range, and this way we can just go through 65,536. We have some reserved bits in the 64 bits, so like we can just like scale for like a lot of years. So basically, every data inside our database falls under two categories. Either it's an object or it's a mapping table. So all our objects tables have been designed after FriendFeed's MySQL post, like by Brent Taylor. Like every object is almost in a local ID, which is auto increment, and a, just a MySQL blob. And we just store serial, serialized JSON data or serialized thrift data. Like we just started to work with thrift. And the others part is like the mapping table. Let's say like you want to find all the boats that belong to Yash. So like you just go to the table called user has boats. You just query on the user ID, you get the boat ID, then you go to the boat table and just get all the boat data out. And it's like just you just decompose your join and like each query has a cache before it. So like effectively you will just hit a mem cache. And which and every mapping table has a timestamp just to like have the ordering like when did you create a board and what is the order you created the boards and all that. And we chose a careful naming schema, so all the mapping tables are like noun, verb, noun, just to be descriptive, like user follows board, user likes pin, and all the objects are just nouns, like users, likes, comments. And almost like 60% of our queries are simple primary key lookups, like give me this user, like give me these 10 user IDs, give me these 20 users, or like give me the board IDs that belong to this user. There's always a primary key on the mapping table on all on both the columns. So it's like 60% of our queries are like super simple primary key lookups. And the most important thing of our sharding is the data never moves from any shard. Once the data is in that shard, it's going to be in that shard forever. <laughs> we just move the shard to a different host, but we never move the data from a shard to another shard. That was one of the reasons why we really like the current approach is like you don't have to move a data from one shard to another and like update some mappings, which is like a lot of hassle. But you, you might get data symmetry across your shards, but this is just out of the box, super scalable solution. And all tables exist on all shards, there are no like special shards. 
just it's just super symmetrical solution. And one approach is like we do not have we do not have to run any schema changes. Let's say you want to add an attribute to a user like location, you just go and start adding location to the blob, and you can version your blobs like okay, this the last version was this, and when the next time you read, you can repair the blob and write it back. Which is like super cool and like if you want an index, just create a new table and start writing to that table. So like if you want to get all the users in Santa Clara, you just add a new uh, index table called location underscore users and start writing the location and the user IDs and we just create a table. And tomorrow you want to drop that index table, just drop it and uh, it's just a matter of seconds. And here's a, some sort of code how we create a pin. So like we take the board ID to which that pin belongs and pass the pin data. We just decompose the board ID and get the shard ID and the local ID of the board. But then we issue a write to the to our rest layer where like, okay, complete this write to this shard of this object type and here's your data. And it just returns the local ID in the table and then we compose the complete global ID and just return the pin. It's like as simple as that. Here's how we render our user profile. So like, that's the user profile page on Pinterest. So you basically get the username from the URL to the username to user ID lookup, break the user ID, get the local ID, go to the table, get the user object, go to the user has boats table, get the board IDs, go to the boats table, get the boats, go to the board has pins table, get the pins, go to the pins table, get, get the pins. So like it looks like we're running a lot of queries, but all of these are like simple memcache hits, and like we do not have redundant, redundant data in memcache. It's like either an ID to ID or an ID to an object inside memcache. So we just have like pretty much down to metal scripting. This is another stage in your in your sharding that you just it's constantly underestimated, but. I think it, this is like the most important and painful part of your sharding, where you write this application code to write to split your writes to the new shards and to the old infrastructure. But you have like few days to move all your old data from your old infrastructure to the new shiny shards. We had a huge problem dealing with this. Like we wrote a couple of mistakes in the scripts, then we had to like drop the data. It's like it's just you just had to spend enough time for capacity planning this and like you just need enough time to like move your data from your old database and like we just built a scripting farm where we just like put more Amazon boxes and just add these workers to our queue and just put all the old IDs and then into a list and then we pop the each ID from the list, go get all his associated data right to the shards and then just keep doing rinse and repeat the same step. We used an open source product called Pyrus, which is on GitHub, which is effectively a clone of R GitHub's Rescue, which is based on Redis list. Okay, fairly simple. It was like awesome. And we just adopted it as our uh, task processor in our, in, in our infrastructure. Here are some future problems we are like trying to hit. Like, we have these hundreds of app servers connecting to a pretty much every shard and like all the memcache boxes and like we're blowing up connections on our memcache boxes. We started memcache daemons with like 4,000 connections and like we hit it pretty fast. We had to kill the daemon again like start with 12,000 connections and like constantly when we're like, having more traffic and we're booting more app servers to handle the load, we're just blowing up the connections and we, we can't keep doing this forever. So like we're, look, we're looking into service-oriented architecture where you just have like a third service, a follower service, and like pretty much like the bigger chunk of your code just like move it into a service and like have teams dedicated to the service and just make it faster. And it's just more easier to manage and just more easier to scale as well. Like you just measure the latencies on each service and then you can like scale it much better rather than having like a huge monolithic code base. A couple of interesting tidbits we learned while we were sharding was like, read slaves are great, but they won't just take you forever. Like we had, we added a one or two read slaves. It was great. It was working. And like as we saw more traffic, we just threw read slaves, and we were incurring that I/O cost on all the slaves we had. We had like five, six slaves at one point, and like we realized like this is not working. Like the master is under huge load, and like the master has to distribute all its data to the slaves. There's this replication lags and like somebody pins and like they go to the page and it's a 404 because like the data hasn't been transferred to the slaves. So like 
it's just a temporary measure. Like if you are, if you think you have, you needed more than three slaves, you just have to rethink what you are exactly doing and what you are trying to achieve. And another feature we learned is like when you are building feeds, Memcache and Redis are your like best friends. Like the the ability to append, uh, do perform atomic appends on the list is just valuable. It's like that's how like Twitter and like Pinterest feeds are like powered. It's like completely Redis list. Like you just push these bits of data into the list, and they just appear almost real time. And you can do this in a much uh, optimal way. Like Redis supports transactions. You just ship a huge text file. Like okay, I print this new ID to like this five thousand list, and like it's just written in like twenty milliseconds. And one thing we learned is like if you prioritize your background task, you just get a lot of efficiency. Initially, we had a bunch of workers dedicated to repin this, into, resize this new pins, and we had this a bunch of workers dedicated to like push these pins to all the followers' home fields. Instead of doing this, we just started prioritizing the tasks, and so we had like this prioritizing, prioritizing queue where ten being like the top priority and one being the lowest. So like when we push uh, all the workers first, perform a pop on the the highest priority. If they get a job, they just finish it, and they keep falling back to the lower priorities. So that way, we just had one huge cluster, and we're running these scripting jobs at like priority one. Like, okay, move all this old data of these users to this chain, to this new sharded infrastructure. And like, as the new pins coming, we were just serving the requests. And when there was the traffic was low, we all our workers were spending all their time like scripting this the data from your old to new infrastructure. We just wrote a customer tailored to a sharding, like you just ask, like give me this user, it would just perform a memcache lookup, go to the our rest layer, fetch the data right to the cache, give it back to you. And it would just like does some cool stuff like you know like put a you know, increment into the stats key, like is it a cache hit, is it a database hit? And like it's pretty much like worth time investigating into building an ORM and ha have all these cool features built into your ORM. Uh, Lessons we learned, <laughs> at least for me, was like when your Pinterest is awesome, like you just get to work on this cool stuff, and pretty much you should just reach just millions of people in like a couple of seconds. And we just deploy hundreds of time every day. And just like every other company, we are hiring. If you're interested, like come <laughs> here or like write us email to us. And with that, I'll just leave it to questions. Sure. Do you do any analytics on the behavior of? What happens? Uh, like what? Sorry. Like um, we just hired our data team, like you guys, like Mohammed and Dimitri, like who just set up this huge EMR cluster, and we are using Flume to log all our data into this cluster, and we are running tile queries. It's been like fantastic, but we're still like learning to log. We're looking into Thrift and like JSON, and like still we're still in like pretty early, but we are definitely. Extracting some data from all the data we collect. Are you the only two DBAs? Uh, we're like the only new support on the sharding part, but right now we have 15, 12, 15. 12 engineers. Uh, we, we do a little of everything at this company. Any fire, we send some guys on it. Uh, so we don't really have a person who's a DBA. <laughs> well, good we're job. all DBAs. I was going to say, are you hiring? Because everyone's hiring. Oh, we're hiring. Yeah, yeah it's it. Right, one back slot. There you go. Exactly. Hi, <laughs> oh, uh, real quick, I just want to uh, also, uh, can everybody hear me? I, don't know. I wanted to acknowledge real quick, uh, this is Ryan from Bosco. He was also heavily instrumental in, in designing everything that we built, but he couldn't be here today. More questions? Um, how do you, this is nothing to do with databases, but I'm interested. How do you deal with, um, you know, that, that age-old problem of, what do they call it, bandwidth stealing or something? Like, if you use a picture from something else, do you actually copy the picture? Yeah, we make, uh, we copy the image into our CDN and, and we create, like, a couple of thumbnails of different sizes and we actually and credit the pen to their source. Right, right. Well, that helps, but you're also not stealing the bandwidth when using the picture. No, we so that helps. Copy That's the, the big picture. thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Active or master, master application. Are they both active or one active? Only one is active. Although we can just make our uh, rest layer point to the other active, we were like, you know what's the point? Like, we, we, the single <laughs> shot is able to handle all our traffic, and pretty much it's a PK lookup. So we could, at, at, at any point of time, only one guy is the master. And then the, uh, like, even remember, you have all of these data, pins, follow, and everything is in 
Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's almost completely true. We do have a few things like uh, our system allows us to put it any, anywhere, so we have collaborative boards. So I can actually put a pen on a collaborative board, which may be on a different shard. But because our uh, mapping table has full IDs to full IDs, I can map a user ID to any boards anywhere. Uh, trying to keep stuff collocated is really more of an optimization, but it's not a requirement at all. And in fact, we, we do have mappings that point to different shards. Just to mapping is global just, ID with global ID. That's right. Yes. Just to explain a bit more, like, let's say I have a board and I invite you as a collaborator. And let's say I have like a textbook board which I have on Pinterest. So like if I have, invite you as a collaborator and when you pin something, the ping goes to my shard because I own the board. But you have this mapping table where the like, user has these pins, but only the mapping goes to your shard, but the data exists on my shard, basically. Yeah. You guys use uh, Memcache on Redis? Or is it just the... I don't know, we just use Memcache as like an object cache, which is like user ID to the object basically JSON structure of object of thrift serialized. We use Redis only for like lists and sets. But actually, uh, one cool thing we do with, do with Memcache is it has this pin notion, which uh, not many people use. And you, if you use a streaming uh, uh, list uh, for your value, you can actually append atomically to that Memcache list. And now you've got a basic feed inside Memcache. Uh, the cool part about a pin is that if the key doesn't exist, it doesn't actually do anything. So what you can do is if somebody, if you have a user to pins view, you can bring in a, uh, a cache for that, this feed cache. You bring in a new pin, you put it on the list, and the list doesn't exist, it doesn't get populated. So then uh, uh, if the key gets evicted or you bring in a new cache, you don't have to worry about having partial list and having to script it. So then the next time the person views their list, then we'll populate that memcache uh, uh, list. So basically we built a list on top of memcache because memcache has a prepend and append. But we had to do some stuff like you add a plus two and you remove plus two, you can't remove it because there's no remove notion in Memcache. So you add a minus two and again plus three, minus three. But there were like these bugs where like if the cache was fragmented, it was a bunch on a bunch of keys, you gotta start parsing from the back of the key. Because if there's a minus two and a plus two at the end, we would just like remove but add it at the later, which is like a wrong. So we just like <laughs> thought like okay, Redis is just giving this out of the box. Like why have this? and deal all this complexity. So just, we just moved all our lists into Redis cache, and we just use Redis as an analog, and it just works fantastic. Uh, we only we don't have any production serving traffic on Mongo. It was like an analytics tool, like when we, because like every day, like, oh, I want this new analytic column, like, I want this aggregated to the last 30 days, last 45 days, 30 percent of our users, and we perform these tests in our <coughs> AB, AB experimentation and all that. So we can't keep running like uh, schema migrations on MySQL. So that was the reason we chose Mongo. We had a lot of other data in Mongo, but once we went through the catastrophic route, we just dealt like all production data only sticks in MySQL, and they are allow you to cache or Redis and nothing else. Our MySQL boxes, ourselves. I images or not, uh, those are served by S3 and Akamai. Just, to be, just um, to be clear, we don't use EBS, we just write the local ephemeral drives. We use the 15 gig instance, which has four drives. We rate all the four drives for the data, and we have multi mastering different availability zones. And we snapshot every uh, the slave shard every 12, 24 hour interval and upload it to S3. Thanks for coming. Yeah,